Hello, I'm Dr. Larry Goldenberg. I'm a professor of urologic sciences at the University of British Columbia and a urologist at the Vancouver General Hospital. I'm also a co-director of the Vancouver Prostate Center. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to the prostate gland as a newly diagnosed patient with prostate cancer. At the end of this video, I hope you will have an understanding of what the prostate gland is, what prostate cancer is, and what the best possible management might be for your disease. Now, you're not alone. In Canada, 25,000 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. It's estimated that one in six to one in seven men will actually be diagnosed with prostate cancer sometime after the age of 50. Many of these men are going to have difficulties in making their decisions just like you might be having. So I hope that this video will help you understand and help you make an informed decision. Over the next few minutes, I will explain the anatomy of the prostate, what its function is, and how cancer arises from the prostate. After that, we'll talk about the different treatment options to help you make an informed decision. The prostate is a gland that sits below the urinary bladder in men. This is a very important gland because its secretions maintain the health of sperm as they travel through the reproductive process. Now the prostate in aging males is prone to develop several different problems. In many men the prostate will grow naturally and begin to block up the urinary channel and cause urinary symptoms. In other men prostate cancers can develop in the prostate and in some men you can get an infection or an inflammation of the prostate. All of these diseases are separate entities but they may present with similar symptoms. So for example you may have trouble with urination that could be due to benign growth or to an inflammation. A very important message is that prostate cancer particularly in its earliest stages does not cause symptoms. So you need to be checked and you make sure that your, all of your family members and friends get checked as well because prostate cancer, when it's diagnosed at an early stage, is very curable. So now where does prostate cancer arise from? Well, as I mentioned, the prostate is a gland. It makes secretions. Now these secretions come from cells which line the glands and ducts of the prostate. Each one of those cells has the potential to become cancerous. Once that cell becomes cancerous, it loses its normal control mechanisms that normal cells in the body have and it starts to grow faster. And when it grows faster, it becomes more aggressive and can actually find its way outside of the ducts or outside of the glands into the support structures of the prostate where it then continues to grow and it turns into small lumps which then become larger lumps. And then these larger lumps can become dangerous as they pass on to other parts of the body. And that's when men run into real life-threatening situations. But if you can catch that cancer when it's just a small clump of cells, then you can cure it. And there, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll discuss some of the different treatment options. The prostate is a gland that sits just underneath the urinary bladder in men. Urine passes through the middle of the prostate in the urinary tube, which we call the urethra. The prostate itself is a gland that makes secretions which come out in the ejaculate and are very important for healthy reproductive life. Now just below the prostate there is a control valve or a muscle called the sphincter. This is a voluntary sphincter that you could use to stop and start your urinary stream. The prostate itself and parts of the bladder are important for urinary control as well. The prostate is also a very important organ for sexual function in that there are nerves and blood vessels which pass by the prostate to the penis which are very critical to normal erectile function. As a gland, the prostate also makes a protein called prostate specific antigen or PSA. PSA is very rich in the ejaculatory fluid but some of it normally leaks back into the bloodstream. In cancers, more PSA is made and more of it leaks into the bloodstream so we can pick up an elevated level. And that's probably one of the reasons why you had your biopsy and how your cancer was diagnosed. 
Now these glands are where the cancer arises. Each gland has small cells that are lining the interior of it. Those cells can become malignant. A cancerous change happens within the cells and then that cell loses its normal control mechanism so it starts to divide faster and faster and you get a buildup of these cells. At the same time they can break through the walls of these ducts and glands and spread into the supporting tissues of the prostate where they really take off and start to build up into lumps. Once you, there is a lump that can be felt you're at a little bit more of an advanced stage. Now going back to these cells, we can categorize how aggressive a cancer is growing by the appearance of these cells under the microscope when we do a biopsy of your prostate. So you've had your biopsy and the pathologist has looked at your cells under the microscope and has applied a grading system to those cells which reflect the aggressiveness of the cancer. A very clever man named Don Gleason looked at many, many prostate cancers and he realized that the appearance of the cells and the architecture of the cancer actually correlates to the aggressiveness of the cancer. So he looked at the very m mildest forms of cancer and he assigned a grade to those of one. And then the more aggressive cancers were two and then three up to a grade of five. So he was able to stratify cancers from least aggressive to most aggressive by a scoring system of one to five. When we do a biopsy, we pick up different cancers within their prostate. Not all cancers are the same within your gland. Some of your cancer might be grade two, some of it grade three, some of it grade five. Depending on what the needle found when it took these cores out of your prostate, the pathologist will grade and quantify the cancer. What he will tell you is that you had a lot of one category, perhaps three, but you had a little bit of another category, perhaps four. And when we add those two numbers together, it gives us the Gleason score. So in that scenario, it was 3 plus 4 equals 7. So you would have a Gleason score of 7. If it was 4 plus 4 or 4 plus 5, clearly it would be an 8 or a 9. Now the Gleason scoring system has become our best way of predicting how a particular cancer in a particular individual will behave. It is not perfect, and what we see as a score on your biopsy may not reflect ultimately what is actually going on in your prostate, because as you know, the prostate biopsy was just a sampling. It was like sticking a pitchfork into a haystack. Now, in that haystack, there may be a beach ball, and we could have caught just the edge of that beach ball. It could have been a golf ball, and we caught the golf ball. Maybe there were a softball and a beach ball and we caught a little bit of both of those. But we don't know for sure just from the sampling what exactly is going on within that haystack, the analogy to your prostate. We make an educated guess and we wish we had a crystal ball and certainly we're seeking that holy grail of being able to predict just from a biopsy or a blood test how your cancer in your case is going to behave and then how we would recommend that cancer be treated. So prostate cancer comes in all shapes and sizes. Even within your own prostate, you can have different grades of cancer. Now there's a couple other terms that you're going to hear that are important. One of those terms is stage. Your doctor is going to tell you that you have a certain stage of prostate cancer. And what he's talking about is the amount of cancer that is in your prostate. If their lump has become large enough that we can actually feel a bump, we call that a stage 2 or a T2. If your PSA is elevated but your prostate feels soft and benign, we don't feel any lumps, but we do the biopsies and we find cancer, then you're what's called as T1C. The more advanced the cancer is, the higher the stage. So if you're a stage 3 or a T3, it usually means that the cancer is already beginning to spread outside of the prostate into its surrounding tissues. 
and a T4 is the most advanced stage. When we talk about treatment, we have to personalize the treatment or tailor it to your cancer, to its features, to your medical condition, to your social condition, and ultimately to your own preferences. As physicians, we can give you an idea, sort of an educated guess, as to how much cancer you have and how likely that cancer is to spread and become life-threatening. Grade is the other very important feature, which I've already discussed. And thirdly, the actual value of the PSA and how the PSA has changed over time will also help us categorize you into what we would call a high risk, intermediate risk, or a low risk type of a cancer. And that helps guide you and us into the appropriate treatment realm. So what do I mean by those risk factors? I think a good analogy is the barnyard analogy. Pretend you walk into a barnyard and there's a bird, a rabbit, and a turtle. Now, when you walk in, you're going to startle the bird, and it's going to fly away. Now, if you've got a good bow and arrow or a gun or a net, you probably catch some of those birds, but many of them are going to be gone before you can, you can do much about it. The turtle is going to sit there, maybe poke his head out of its shell, have a look at you, it might start to move around, and eventually it could find its way out, or if it's really close to the, to the fence, it could get out a little sooner. The bunny rabbit is going to start to bounce around, and eventually, sooner than later, we'll get out of the barnyard. So if we use that analogy and you think about prostate cancer like those three animals, a low-risk prostate cancer is like a turtle. It will grow. It is a cancer. It's going to move, but it's going to move very slowly. And in fact, in many men, that cancer may not have any impact whatsoever on lifespan or general health. The other extreme are the birds, and they account for the 4,000 deaths we see every year in Canada for prostate cancer, so clearly we want to find the birds, and we want to be very aggressive in managing those birds because we want to do the best we can for those men and prevent death. And then a large number of these cancers are like the bunny rabbits. They just hop around there, but they're going to grow steadily, but we have a good chance of capturing them and getting them under control. So depending on your risk strata, your category, low, intermediate, or high, the treatment will differ. Once your doctor has told you what risk your cancer is, that is low, intermediate, or high, we have to look at so many other factors and you have to consider these in making your treatment decision. These factors include your general medical health, your age and life expectancy, perhaps family history, your social history, your sexual health, your urinary health. So there's many factors that come into play and you want to discuss these all with your physician so that you're very clear on what is best for you. I often think about making the treatment decision like buying a stock. You're not going to just go out and buy any stock. You're going to do your due diligence so that at the end of the day you're comfortable in putting your money down. So no, irregardless of the outcome, you will feel comfortable that you made an intelligent decision, you made an educated decision, and therefore you'll have very little regret no matter what the outcome is. Same with making a decision for a medical therapy. Now we have many options for prostate cancer, and that's sort of good and bad. Sometimes it would be nice if the doctor could say to you, you have one choice, take it or leave it. But with prostate cancer, we actually have the luxury to have multiple choices. And again, we have to tailor that to your needs and what we feel and what you feel is best for you. So the different treatment options are listed here. We have active surveillance, surgical treatments, radiation-based treatments, and hormonal-based treatments. Your doctor has told you that you have intermediate risk disease. So this is the bunny rabbit that I described in the earlier analogy. So your cancer will progress and it'll progress regularly and it will likely eventually become much more dangerous. It could take a year, it could take three years or more, we just don't know. But because we know that it's likely to progress, now is the time to take care of it. And there really are three treatment options for intermediate risk disease. 
The two most commonly used treatments are surgery or radiation. The third treatment has to do with the testosterone in your body, so-called hormone therapy. Surgery involves the removal of the prostate and these two little pouches that are attached to the prostate known as seminal vesicles. These little pouches are like storage containers for ejaculatory fluid. We take this organ out and then reconnect the bladder and the urethra in such a way that we can maximize normal urination through the urethra with good urinary control. Now surgery, whether it's on the prostate or any other part of the body, has potential consequences or complications. In the immediate phases of surgery, when you're actually undergoing the surgery under anesthetic, there are problems that could arise with your heart, your lungs, with bleeding. In the early phases of recovery, you could run into an infection, urinary leakages, lymphatic leakages, and, and other minor problems, which for the most part are curable, and the doctor can take care of them for you. There are two longer-term consequences, however, to surgery that need to be carefully thought of. First of all, a small percentage of men do not recover normal urinary control. It's a situation we call incontinence, or involuntary urine loss. If your sphincter muscle is just not strong enough to withhold the urine, you may lose a few drops now and then if you cough or sneeze or jump around. If it's really weak, you may have a continuous loss of urine. Fortunately, the more severe forms of leakage or incontinence are quite rare. They really are unusual. Probably in the range of 90 to 95 percent of men will regain normal urinary control or what we call social continence, meaning you might want to keep a Kleenex or a small pad in your underwear just in case you lose a drop or two of urine. If you have more severe leakage, there are treatment options for that. The other longer term consequence has to do with your sexual function. The nerves that are responsible for triggering erections run very close to the prostate. Taking the prostate out from between the nerves in what we call a nerve sparing operation, sort of like peeling an onion and removing the onion and leaving the peel behind. It's delicate surgery, but it's very possible. We can do it in many cases successfully, and men will regain eventually their ability to attain an erection. If those nerves need to be sacrificed because you have intermediate risk disease and your doctor is concerned that maybe cancer will be left behind if he tries to preserve the nerves, then they will have to be sacrificed and alternative methods will have to be found for inducing your erections and maintaining some form of sexual function. If you have the nerve sparing operation, don't expect to have erections immediately after the surgery. They're going to be lost just because of injury to the nerves. And nerves can take a year or even longer, 18 months perhaps, to heal. During that time, your doctor may put you into what we call a sexual rehabilitation program or penile rehabilitation program. That involves taking a regular dose of one of our erectile pills, Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis, usually in a small dose, just enough to induce blood flow into the penis while things are healing on the inside. At the same time, we have mechanical or artificial means of inducing full erections so that you can regain sexual functioning. These involve vacuum devices or intracorporeal needle injections, which are needles going directly into the body of the penis with special drugs that cause the penis to get hard. So there are ways to recover sexual function, but it won't be the same. So expect a change in your sexual functioning. Talk this over with your partner, with your physician, sexual health clinician, and it's best to maybe understand what you might be looking at after the surgery before the operation. There are several different surgical approaches to the radical prostatectomy operation. The standard is an incision that is made just below the belly button down to the pubic bone, and through that space the prostate is removed and all the surgery is done. Another option is what we call minimally invasive surgery, or MIS, or laparoscopic 
prostatectomy. This is carried out through a series of small little incisions in the upper abdomen and a scope is placed as well as working instruments and this prostate is removed through the incision that is just above the belly button. The third approach is the use of a robot to assist the laparoscopic approach, what we call a robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy. Some people call it the da Vinci operation because the robot is termed the da Vinci robot. This is a wonderful technology that has been available now for close to 10 years in some parts of the world. And the surgeon sits at a console remote from the patient while the robot arms manipulate the different um, instruments that are inside the body for surgically removing the prostate. There are some advantages to the robotic assisted operation. Primarily, excellent view of the anatomy. No tremor on the instruments. Usually very little blood loss. And in general, a faster recovery from the surgery. But at the end of the day, inside, it's still the same operation. And the longer term consequences that relate to urinary control or sexual function are still important. Radiation therapy is the other gold standard option that you are looking at for your intermediate risk prostate cancer. Radiation can be delivered in one of two ways, either through interstitial seeds. These are little implants that are radioactive and placed in the prostate, or by what we call external beam radiation, which is radiation coming from the outside targeting the prostate. The way radiation works is that it's in the area, the, the prostate tissue is radiated, so if one of the cancer cells starts to divide, it dies during that division process. And eventually, all of the cancer cells will thus be eliminated. Now, the advantages of radiation, clearly over surgery, are that you don't have to undergo a major operation with the operative consequences. Perhaps a downside to the radiation is that it's based only on the biopsy, which may understage or undergrade the cancer. Nevertheless, the experience all around the world with radiation therapy has been very positive, particularly for this risk of disease. Radiation can lead to early consequences. A lot of men will notice irritation when they urinate or even difficulty in getting the urine out. Fortunately, in most cases, this is temporary. In the long run, there could be a little bit of lack of control, more likely an urgency to urinate as your bladder has contracted a little bit from the radiation, occasionally bleeding problems from the urine or the bowels. Most of these problems are controllable and you can live with them quite well. Radiation does impact on sexual function as well. The radiation in the area of the nerves can damage those nerves. Now, unlike surgery, where you lose your erections almost immediately after the surgery, with radiation it's more of a delayed impact. As time goes on and the radiation impacts on those nerves and the blood vessels going down to the penis, you will start to lose the ability to get an erection. Just like in surgery, there are means of inducing erections artificially so that you can remain sexually active if that is a desire that you have. There are differences between the implanted radioactive seeds and the external beam radiation, which you should dis discuss with your physician or a radiation oncologist. Another option for intermediate risk prostate cancer involves hormone therapy. The prostate is a hormone dependent organ in the body. Testosterone, which comes from our testicles, stimulates the growth of the prostate throughout life and keeps it healthy. But when a disease affects the prostate, such as prostate cancer, it actually starts to use testosterone as a fuel. The fuel drives the growth of the cancer and can make it more aggressive with time and eventually spread and it becomes a real problem. So we know that removing testosterone from the male body is like taking the gasoline out of a car. The cancer will stop growing. It will lose its fuel, and a lot of the cancer cells will actually disappear. 
Not all prostate cancer, however, is eliminated with testosterone removal, so that eventually, with time, cancer cells start to grow again in the absence of testosterone. So for intermediate risk disease, your doctor might recommend that you take a temporary course of hormone therapy, types of drugs that make your testicles stop producing testosterone, have your radiation treatment, sometimes combined with surgery, and then after the treatment is done, the drugs are stopped so that your own testosterone cut levels come back to normal and you continue on with all of your normal male functioning. In some scenarios, depending on age, your own choice, social circumstances, and so on, hormone therapy alone might be the treatment of choice. When we remove the testosterone from the body, there are consequences other than the positive effect on the cancer. When you remove testosterone, you are putting a man into the menopause. You will feel tired, your energy levels won't be what you're used to, you'll be a little bit more emotionally labile, you may get hot flashes. In the long term, if you're on hormone treatments for long periods of time, they can impact on your muscle strength and on your bone health. In some scenarios, particularly if you have underlying heart disease, it may be troublesome for your heart and blood vessels. So hormone therapy has to be considered very carefully. And there are new ways of approaching hormone therapy, such as intermittent therapy, which you might want to discuss with your physician as well. So I hope you have a better understanding of what the prostate gland is, how prostate cancer develops, and what your different treatment options might be. Remember, everyone is different and every prostate cancer is different. So we have to tailor what is best for you for your own treatment. Speak to your physician, learn as much as you can about your prostate cancer and what the consequences of the different treatment options might be for you and your loved ones.